Hello, and on behalf of Great Pond Foundation's Board of Directors and staff, we'd like to welcome you to the Island Ponds Community Workshop. My name is Emily Reddington, and I'm the Executive Director of Great Pond Foundation. At Great Pond Foundation, we believe the water that divides us from the mainland unites us as a community, and that protecting that the island's water is essential to our sustainability. I want to recognize the efforts of our staff that went into making today possible, all the behind the scenes work of Julie and Aaron, thank you very much, and especially to David, um, our outreach watershed manager, um, because he's done a whole bunch of graceful wrangling that brought us all together today. So David, take us away. All right, thanks, Emily. Um, and yes, welcome everybody. So this entire series of events was made possible through the generous support of the ED Foundation, who have our collective and heartfelt gratitude for their dedication to our island community. Before we get started, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the members of our steering committee, Amy Salzman and Greg Palermo, for their tireless efforts in making these events a success. And I'd like to thank our keynote speaker, Dr. Javier Lloret, for lending his time to join us today. I'd also like to give a special thank you to our co-moderators, Matt Poole and Omar Johnson of the Edgartown and West Sudbury Boards of Health, as well as to all of our panelists for granting us their time, their wisdom, and expertise for today's panel discussion. Lastly, I'd like to thank our island community as a whole for all the wonderful feedback we received while creating these events and for their collective dedication and care in managing our shared island pond resources. The Island Ponds Community Workshop was created from a recognized desire for increased communication and collaboration between the many public entities, nonprofit organizations, riparian owners associations, and individuals who manage and care for our island ponds. It's our hope that the topics discussed herein will help to foster a greater understanding of the collective, collective issues we face in all the ponds and watersheds across Martha's Vineyard, as well as provide inspiration for more action-oriented conversations and initiatives in the future. For the curious members of the public who are joining us today, we hope that these workshops will provide you with a glimpse of some of the major issues that we as a community are facing. So this series is comprised of three separate events throughout this December and January. The primary subject of each workshop was determined through an outreach survey that we conducted to gauge the overall interest in a variety of important issues facing our island ponds. We received an outstanding response, the results of which determine the content of these events. As such, today we'll be focusing on excess nitrogen and land use. Next week on December 9th, we'll host another speaker and panel discussion focusing on harmful algal blooms, followed by a supplementary information session on invasive species. And finally, our last workshop on January 13th will focus on data and pond management in the era of climate change. Now, before we get started, I wanna quickly explain the structure of this workshop. Uh, the entire event is being recorded and will afterwards be accessible to the public through the Great Pond Foundation's website. Uh, we're using a webinar format, so all attendees are automatically muted with video turned off so that we can focus on our speakers. In a few moments, I'm going to hand over the microphone to Javier for his keynote presentation, for which there'll be a short question and answer session at the end. If you have a question, please type your questions into the chat window, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. We're going to take the questions on a first come, first serve basis, and we're going to do our best to field as many as possible in the time that's provided. After Javier's segment, we will begin our panel discussion and we will start with some prepared questions for our panelists and then transition into taking more questions from the audience during the second half of that segment. Again, please utilize your chat function to type your questions and we'll do our best to get to as many of them as possible. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Javier Lloret. Javier is a research scientist with the Ecosystem Center at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole. Javier received his PhD from the University of Murcia in Spain and specializes in the impacts of nutrient pollution and other environmental stressors across ecosystems. Today, he's gonna to be sharing with us his research with nitrogen isotopes and how they can be used to identify nitrogen pollution sources. And Javier, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us today, welcome. Um, you have the floor. Thanks to you, David, and, and Emily as well. And of course, thanks everyone for, for coming today to, to listen to this talk and, and be part of the, the panel. Let me share my screen because I have a small presentation to show you guys. And yeah, today I just wanted to give you all a little update on some of the results of this project that 
we have been working on for, for a few months already about using stable isotopes as tools to identify both the sources and as well as the effects of nitrogen pollution in uh, Edgar Town Great Pond. It's a project that I've done in collaboration with my team in the Marine Biological Laboratory, as well as our colleagues in the Edgar Town Great Pond Foundation. Uh, even though my name is here, I would like to acknowledge that this is a group effort. Uh, well, our towns and municipalities around Cape Cod and the island, and I would say around the world, are facing uh, this thing that I'm calling here in this slide, uh, this nitrogen dilemma, right? Obviously, uh, we need nitrogen. Nitrogen is, a, is an element that is basic for life. And it's in our bodies and, and we use it to grow our, our food. So there are clear benefits of having access to, to this element, right? But there's also some drawbacks and probably one of the most dramatic examples of uh, the drawbacks of the excessive nitrogen uh, inputs that we humans are putting into the environment is the degradation of our coastal ponds and estuaries. Uh, the appearance of algal blooms, the decreasing water quality, and the existence of fish and shellfish kills that are becoming more and more frequent you know, in our coastal ecosystems, like the one uh, depicted on the, the photo on the bottom. Uh, with that problem in mind, we wanted to uh, develop an initiative of this pilot project to address the topic of nitrogen pollution in our coastal ponds and focusing on this uh, first uh, attempt, this uh, pilot project on Great Pond. Uh, with the intention of, uh, uh, the intention was dual. On one hand, we wanted to identify uh, more clearly the sources of this nitrogen pollution, but we were also interested in quantifying some of the effects of that nitrogen pollution in the ecosystems within Great Pond. Uh, with respect to the sources, well, uh, we have a pretty good understanding of where the sources are, right? It's basically the, the human development on the land is causing more and more nitrogen being put into the land, and that nitrogen eventually will make its, its way into our coastal uh, ponds and estuaries. Uh, that nitrogen comes from three different sources, a fertilizer application in our fields, but also in our lawns. The wastewater inputs of nitrogen, the result from uh, the urbanization of the coast, and also the contamination of the atmosphere with nitrogen components that are get emitted to the atmosphere due to fossil fuel combustion. Uh, this drawing at the bottom, it's just to, to highlight the fact that the intensification of our land, land uses is what causes this increase in nitrogen loads to estuaries. It's this connectivity between the land and the sea, the land surrounding the estuary, what we call the watershed, the intensification of land uses in that land causes more and more nitrogen to enter our coastal systems. However, there are certain questions that come to mind uh, by, by looking at these sources. The first being, well, how much of each source is our pond receiving, right? How much wastewater, how much fertilizer, how much atmospheric uh, nitrogen uh, reaches our ponds, right? Because knowing which source is the prevalent source can help us focus more our management actions. And also very important, from where? Where is all that nitrogen coming from? And what are the effects? <clears throat> Trying to answer some of these questions, we have relied in, in many cases in nitrogen loading models that allow us to, to calculate or give an estimate to the different contributions by the different sources, the different human sources that, uh, for that nitrogen that we put on land. And this slide is just to show you guys more or less how these models work, how these estimates are being produced. Basically, these models all rely on information about the different land uses that we have on land. And that's what is represented here with this house for the housing developments, a street, a little lawn, uh, some crops and some natural vegetation. And basically what the models do is that they quantify the different inputs of wastewater, atmospheric deposition 
or fertilizer nitrogen to each one of these different land uses. Now, here on Cape Cod and the islands, we don't have major rivers. So that nitrogen makes its way into the estuary via groundwater. It's carried out by the rainwater. It penetrates the soils. It goes through this kind of intermediate zone that I'm calling here the battle zone and enters our aquifers. Now the aquifer water is responsible for transporting all that nitrogen into the estuary that enters the estuary through this area here that I'm calling the seepage phase. Now, what is important to note here is that not all the nitrogen that we put on land makes it into the estuary. There's gonna be some interception uh, by the plants and microbes in the soil, in the vital zone, and even in the aquifer. And that's what I try to represent here with these little numbers here that come from some of these natural loaded models that quantify how much interception occurs in, it, in the transit, in the traveling time, that nitrogen goes through from the surface of the land and into the estuary. To give you a reference, for example, the MEP models, the Massachusetts Estuaries Project model, quantified how much nitrogen comes uh, from land and enters a uh, great pond. And those numbers uh, are equivalent to approximately 11 tons of nitrogen per year. 66% of that, two thirds, coming from wastewater sources. So it's clear just by looking at these estimates that uh, wastewater is the major problem uh, that Great Pond is facing in terms of nitrogen pollution and eutrophication. However, I would like to remind you that a model is only a snapshot estimate of how much nitrogen enters the system. And I would like to highlight two words in this uh, sentence, snapshot, an estimate. Snapshot because it's only quantifying the amount of nitrogen that is entering the system in a particular moment on time when we have data for all these land uses. But we know that these land uses are constantly changing and the relative contribution of nitrogen by these different land uses is also going to be constantly changing. New houses are being built, new houses are being connected to a sewer system, atmospheric deposition can change from year to year. So it's only a snapshot of what happened in a particular moment on time. And the other word that I wanted to highlight is that it's an estimate. These models are based on literature values on the different interception uh, that occurs in the transit of that nitrogen from the land and into the estuary. But it's not the reality, it's a, a a relatively good estimate of how much nitrogen enters the system. And very importantly, another question that arises is, what are the effects of that uh, nitrogen that is entering the estuary? These models can only predict how much nitrogen reaches the estuary at the seepage phase, but it, they don't tell us anything about what happens afterwards with that nitrogen. What are the effects? And all, another question that came to mind when I was preparing this, how do we know if any management action is actually working to remediate the problems that we're observing in our estuary? The models are not capable of giving us uh, uh, the whole picture or, or information about how management is helping reduce the problems associated with nitrogen contamination. Now with, re with uh, respect to the, the, the impact, uh, we also have pretty decent understanding, at, at least from the, the scientific perspective, on how this process of nitrogen pollution and eutrophication takes place in our coastal ponds. It's not that one day you have a, a perfectly healthy pond and the following day, because you put some nitrogen, the pond is completely dead. It, it is a process and it goes through different phases that have some uh, situation that gives us clues that the system is deteriorating. And that's what I try to represent in these little drawings uh, in, in this slide. What we're gonna be seeing here is the bottom of uh, some of our coastal ponds, like, like Great Pond, right? This is the surface of the water in blue, right? And this is the bottom. Uh, in these three phases, what we're gonna be seeing is how the system responds 
uh, to increasing nitrogen loads coming from land. In the situation number one, this will be like the more natural or pristine situation in our coastal ponds, the water clarity is, is great. There are very little uh, amounts of nitrogen reaching the system. And in those conditions, seagrasses like the eelgrass uh, colonizes the bottoms of our coastal estuaries. This is a habitat of very high uh, quality, ecological quality. That's what I try to represent with this happy guy on the, the left side of the, the slide. Now, as we add some nutrients, some nitrogen into the system, what usually happens is that opportunistic bloom forming algae outcompetes the seagrasses from the bottoms. And the, the, the bottoms of, of our estuaries get covered by macroalgae. And also some phytoplankton starts to grow in the water column, making it a little bit murky, right? Uh, as you can see, this habitat is not uh, as good quality as it was before. And that's what I tried to represent here with uh, our friend having a sad face. Now, if we keep adding nutrients even further, what usually happens is that this algal overgrowth, both by phytoplankton and by macroalgae, overwhelms the system. The, the incredible amount of biomass being produced starts to die off and rot in place, consuming all the oxygen, uh, particularly during the summer season. And that is when uh, uh, oxygen starts to go down and can cause fish and shellfish kills. So as you can see, there is a transition uh, from phase to phase as we keep adding nitrogen into our system from a seagrass dominated system to a macroalgal dominated system to a system in which maybe you can only find some phytoplankton. There is a transition between the three major primary producers as the system degrades. Okay, but uh, the question that arises, where are we in this scale? Where is Great Pond located? Is it more in like situation number one with high ecological quality, number two starting to be degraded or, or severely degraded, or is in the ultimate phases of eutrophication? And very importantly, how much nitrogen is needed to transition between the different phases? Because that way we can identify thresholds that we don't want to cross if we don't want to, our system to, uh, to get into a situation that, that we are not uh, willing to have, right? So, well, to try to answer some of these questions that I've been trying to highlight in red in the previous slides, we developed this, this program to go and collect some uh, samples of, of water and biota in, in Great Pond and uh, analyze the, the stable isotopes that are gonna help us figure out a quite, uh, an answer for some of these questions. And this is just a photo of our sampling uh, during the, the end of August, I believe, uh, with our friends from the Great Pond Foundation. Uh, what we sample, we collected water samples and we extracted the phytoplankton cells from there and other suspended material and analyzed the stable isotopes in that material. We also collected samples of submerged uh, aquatic vegetation, eelgrass, and macroalgae that we found in our in different locations throughout the, the pond. And we also collected uh, invertebrates and fish from the pond and analyzed in all these samples our uh, stable isotopic uh, signatures. With the hope of, of getting some answers to those questions that I was presenting before that are gonna give us an overview of an integrated response of the pond to uh, the different nitrogen sources and also very importantly, its effects, the effects of, of that nitrogen. Now, uh, I don't wanna spend too much time on that because I don't wanna get too sciencey and, and bore you guys with uh, the, the chemistry and physics of isotopes, but at least I prepare this uh, slide just to tell you what isotopes are and what we can use them for. Uh, isotopes are just atoms of certain elements that have a, a different weight. They have a, a, a they're a little awkward uh, atoms, right? They're not as uh, light as the regular atoms of that element. 
and they're perfectly normal. They occur naturally in, in, they're in our bodies, they're in the food that we eat, in the air that we breathe. They're pretty normal and pretty st stable. The interesting thing about them is that we can measure them very accurately in the laboratory. And these are some photos of some of the equipment that we're using to, to measure them. And we can use them as tracers. Well, tracers of what? Well, it, that's what I'm trying to, to kind of summarize here in the bottom. For this study, I used uh, two isotopes of two elements, carbon-13 and nitrogen-15. Now, carbon-13, gives us a lot of information of whether a system is influenced by, by the ocean or by land. And that is a very interesting question to, to look at, especially in a brackish ecosystem like Great Pond. You want to know is if the terrestrial inputs are mostly influenced what's going on on Great Pond, or if in contrast, it's most, uh, mostly coming from the ocean. And also, and very importantly, carbon-13 gives us information about which plant is at the base of the food web. If you remember from previous slides, uh, as the system uh, degrades, it transitions from an eelgrass-based ecosystem to a macroalgal-based ecosystem to a phytoplankton-based ecosystem. By looking at carbon-13, I can figure out how our ecosystem is reacting to those changes. Now, nitrogen-15 gives us information about the different position of the animals in the food web, which is something uh, I am very interested in as an ecologist. But I think that one of the most important pieces of information that we can get from nitrogen-15 is about the different nitrogen sources that plants and algae are using to grow. It allows us to differentiate whether our plants and algae in the ecosystem are using wastewater nitrogen, fertilizer nitrogen, or atmospheric uh, deposition nitrogen. That is a very interesting thing to look at. <clears throat> so, well, we, we collected our sample. The next couple of slides, I'm gonna go very fast over this, is just to show you what we found, and then I'll, I'll get into the isotope data, but well, this is the submerged veg vegetation, and I'm putting here in a scale of biomass. Uh, our samples were clearly dominated by Sostera marina. That's the eelgrass uh, shown here in the photo. It, most of the biomass that we collected was uh, eelgrass, which is good news. That is an indicator of a relatively high ecological quality in Great Pond. But we also uh, found uh, several species of macroalgae. And even though they were not as abundant in average as the eelgrass, there were certain locations where they were pretty abundant. So that's something of concern and something to keep an eye on, especially if, if, if these species start to bloom. With regards to the species, it's the usual suspects that you will find a brackish system, Polycephonia, ulva, and so on, depicted here in the, in the second photo. With regards to invertebrates, again, I'm not gonna go over this very much, but we found many bivalves, polychaetes, uh, worms, uh, some crustaceans and even some tunicates. Here are some photos of the, the different animals that we found. We found a lot of these uh, Tegina uh, clams depicted here in the first photo, but also some ribbed mussels, oysters, uh, some worms, as I was saying, uh, some gamarides, and that is the tunicate, the Mogula species that we also found. The usual suspects. Uh, and we also, as I said, collected some, some fish and shrimp. And these are the species that we found and how abundant they were in our, the, the sains that we used to, to collect them. We found lots of mummy chops and silver sites, some sticklebacks and sand shrimp and, and flounder. Again, the, the, the usual species that you, you would expect to find in a grass dominated ecosystem like, like Great Pond. Well, let's have a look at the, the isotope data and what it can tell us about nitrogen sources on one hand and also nitrogen uh, effects on the other hand. The way I'm gonna present this data is in this type of plot, this type of biplot. We're gonna have the carbon signature on the bottom on the horizontal axis and the nitrogen isotope on the vertical axis. And first, in this slide, I'm just gonna show you the primary producers. 
the phytoplankton in yellow, and we have several points because we sampled different times throughout the year, the algae, the macroalgae, the big algae in dark green, and we have several points because we have several species, and the eelgrass in light green over here. Now, if you remember, uh, I told you guys that uh, the nitrogen isotopic signature gives us information about what kind of nitrogen the plants are using to grow. And the higher that value is, the more wastewater nitrogen the plants are using. And the lower the value is, the less wastewater nitrogen the plants are using. So as you can see, all my plants and algae, the algae, the eelgrass, and the phytoplankton, they are all packed in a very narrow band at around six or seven uh, per mil in this scale of the nitrogen isotopic signature. Now, what does that mean? Is that high? Is that low? Is that intermediate? To do that and to answer that question, what I did is I compared this data with my own data that I have collected on Cape Cod for, for several years. And this is what I'm gonna show in the next slide. Here, we're just gonna focus on the nitrogen isotopic signature of different algae that I found in several systems. Here in the bottom in green is Sage Rock Pond, which is a place that is not impacted by wastewater. There's no wastewater inputs entering the in Sage Lot. And these are the numbers that I got uh, for Quashnet River Estuary, which is a moderately impacted ecosystem. And these are the data on top for Charles River Estuary, which is a very severely impacted uh, system by wastewater. As you can see from the values, the range of the values, as well as the averages, that's what's represented with these histograms and these arrows, the values go up between four and six for Sage Lot with, a good, with an average of 4.8, between I would say five and seven for Quashnet with an average of six, and all the way from six and up to 10 for Charles River with an average of around 7.3 indicating this increase, indicating that more wastewater nitrogen is contributing to the growth of this algae. Now, where are we? Where well, it's a uh, great pond. Well, that's what we have in the bottom graph. A great pond, it's all over the place, but I would say that in average, it's around 6.2. <clears throat> so that would put it more or less as moderately impacted by wastewater uh, nitrogen inputs, according to the results of the stable isotopic analysis on the algae. So quite similar to what, what I found in, in the Quashnet River estuary, moderately impacted by wastewater. <clears throat> now, we were talking about averages and ranges, but remember that I told you guys that, that I went to several locations around the pond, right? So um, one of the things, uh, one of the cool things that we can uh, do with these uh, nitrogen isotopic signatures of the algae is that we can try to, to figure out where the wastewater is coming from just by looking at the different signatures of the different samples of algae that I collected around a uh, great pond. <clears throat> and this is what I'm gonna show you in the, in the next uh, map. Uh, <clears throat> these are the values for the nitrogen isotopic signature in the macroalgae that we found in the different locations. And they have been color coded from very low in blue to very high in red and a gradient in between. So as, what you can see in the, in the image it, is that, well, uh, just a reminder, the higher the value is, the more wastewater nitrogen this algae is using to grow. So what you can see in the image is that the wastewater inputs are mostly occurring through the northern and eastern coves that are entering the, the pond and definitely not from the south, from the ocean, and definitely not from Job's uh, neck. The, the western side seems to be pretty uh, clean in terms of wastewater inputs. They're mostly coming from the north and the east uh, side of the pond. That actually matches pretty well what we know about uh, the relative contribution of uh, housing uh, to the nitrogen loads uh, to the watershed. This is an image that uh, our friends from the Great Pound uh, Foundation uh, gave me, showing 
in this shaded area, the watershed uh, of Great Pond, the area of land that is connected to, to Great Pond. And in red, you see the different houses and the, the houses that are highlighted in, in light green, those have been connected to the sewer system. But there are still three major pockets, three hotspots here highlighted with these yellow circles of houses that are not connected to sewer and that are potentially contributing nitrogen, wastewater nitrogen, to the different uh, coves that enter Great Pond. And as you can see, they're in the north and the eastern side of, of the pond, as confirmed by the isotopic signatures in the algae. Well, we have looked at the nitrogen, but uh, we also have the carbon isotopic signature of, of that algae, right? And of the food web of all the animals that are feeding on those algae and, and, and so on. And if you remember from the beginning, the carbon isotopic signatures tells us which plant is at the base of the food web. And that can tell us whether our system is dominated by eel grasses or if it's dominated by macroalgae, or if it's dominated by phytoplankton, right? And by doing so, we can evaluate the current uh, ecological status of Great Pond. So basically what I'm saying is that if our food web uh, is in this part of the graph, in this kind of light uh, green part of the graph, that would indicate that the system, it's an eelgrass-based system, if it's in this uh, dark uh, green part, it will be an algal-based system, kind of intermediate level of pollution. And if it's in the yellow part, I would expect that we're in the ultimate phases of eutrophication and degradation of, of the pond. So, well, uh, this is where our points uh, for the food web uh, fall. So as you can see, most of our points for the different animals that, that, that we were uh, collecting in Great Pond most of them fell within the eelgrass a part of the graph, indicating that the food webs in Great Pond are based on eelgrass and that the pond is at a relatively high, I would say close to high ecological quality status. There are some animals that are overlapping the algal based uh, food web, which is actually matches what we found in terms of amounts of macroalgae. So, you know, there's some concern here, but I would say that overall, the food web is uh, at an area that, that we can consider more or less safe. I mean, if, if I have to give a value to that one, two, three in the scale of eutrophication, I, I would say one and a half. Now, uh, to end with this uh, isotopic data, I wanted to, to think a little bit on, on solutions. And, and one of the things that we were uh, wondering upon and we wanted to, to figure out if it was working or not is the, the, the regular reopening of the inlet of the connection of the pond with the open ocean. And if that helped in a way alleviate the, the problem of nitrogen pollution in Great Pond. And so what we did to, uh, what I did to, to analyze that is that I used the signatures the isotopic signatures of the plankton cells that were in the, in the water column because they respond very fast to these changes and they can show us if things are, are changing. Now, if you remember, the carbon isotope could give us information of whether a system is dominated by terrestrial inputs or if in fact is dominated by marine inputs. And that we can see because in a terrestrially influenced system, the values tend to be very low in this axis. And in a marine influenced system, the values tend to be very high. Now we're gonna see data from the pond in different times of the year, June, July, August, and October. And the inlet was reopened in August 7th. That's that red line here in the middle of the graph. As you can see, those are different points different locations within Great Pond. As you can see, my points were very low before August 7, indicating the terrestrial influence of the inputs, but then immediately after the reopening and afterwards, uh, our points indicating, indicated uh, the marine influence uh, facilitated by the reopening of the, of the inlet. 
So it, it is a, a proof of concept that the inlet reopening actually works at erasing that terrestrial uh, influence of the input. But I think the most important part to see here is what happens to the nitrogen, right? Are we getting rid of the nitrogen or, or not? And let's see what the isotopes can tell us about that. So we're gonna see the same kind of graph, but for nitrogen here. Remember that the higher the nitrogen is, in uh, nitrogen signature, isotopic signature is, the more wastewater nitrogen these plants are using. And the lower the value, the less wastewater nitrogen. As you can see from the points in the graph, before the inlet opening, our values were pretty high, reflecting the inputs of wastewater. But after the opening of the inlet, of the, inlet the values started to go down and they, they were pretty low in October. So what it, that indicates is that the, the opening of the inlet had an effect on the availability of nutrients and effectively uh, flushed away some of that excess wastewater nitrogen that was present in the pond. Well, this is just to summarize some of our findings and I don't wanna go any further, I talk too much. Uh, stable isotopes are very powerful tools to identify both sources as well as the impacts of nitrogen pollution. Uh, I think that we can conclude the Great Pond is in a relatively good ecological status, is dominated by eel grasses, but there are some signs of macroalgal growth. And that's something that we need to keep an eye on. The pond uh, receives uh, moderate inputs of wastewater and the isotope uh, signatures that we found for nitrogen can be comparable to those uh, places on Cape Cod that have intermediate wastewater inputs, which is also to be expected. Uh, now the inputs of wastewater are occurring mostly through the Eastern and Northern coves due to the presence of these urbanized hotspots. Hot and finally, uh, the opening of the inlet uh, to a certain extent, erases the influence of terrestrial inputs and flushes away some excess nutrients. At least that, that, that can be confirmed by the isotopic uh, evidence. In terms of uh, what to do next, well, there's, there's a lot to do, uh, to be honest with you. I mean, this was just a pilot project and I would definitely like to increase the spatial and temporal resolution of the study. And because there are some questions that I can still not address with this limited amount of data, but these are some of the questions that came to mind when I was preparing the presentation. Like for example, how fast or how effectively does the system respond to, to the reopenings on the inlet? That's something that I couldn't uh, get a hold to, onto with, with the limited amount of data, but I think it's a, a very interesting question. Or can we pinpoint locations where the wastewater inputs are occurring? using these isotopes. To do that, I would like to combine our isotope work with, with groundwater sampling and monitoring. I think that's key if we want to understand where the nitrogen is coming from, what kind of nitrogen is entering the system, right? And also considering this second point here, that there is a lag between any changes in end loads to the land, let's say by sewering, and any observable decreases in, end concentrate, in nitrogen concentrations in the pond because groundwater travels so slowly. So keeping a, a constant monitoring of the groundwater, I think it can help us figure out when any management action actually is gonna reach our estuary and improve the conditions in our, in our system. And obviously expand this study to other ponds and estuaries of the island, trying to get a hold on on the, the is, this issue of nitrogen pollution and nitrification at a bigger scale throughout Martha's Vineyard and the rest of Cape Cod. And with that, I think I'm a little over the time. I'm gonna uh, thank you all for, for being here again. Uh, thanks my team uh, at MBL and at the Great Pond Foundation, and I'm gonna open it for questions. Thank you all very much. Hey, Javier, can you hear me? Yep. All right, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Um, we do, you did go over a little bit, but I'm going to spend a few minutes here just uh, uh, feeding you a couple of questions before we move into the panelist section. Um, let's see, the first one is a question from John. Um, is there work analogous to this that is being done regarding phosphorus and freshwater? Good question. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not a freshwater ecologist. 
I have to say, but yeah, there are similar there are similar attempts to do this with with phosphorus too. Uh, now the problem the problem here is finding the right isotopes to do this type of work, right? And with phosphorus, we we don't. I mean, there are some some substances that can be used, but most of the most of the the work that I'm, I'm familiar with uses nitrogen and carbon. Sometimes sulfur isotopes too that can be very interesting in freshwater systems, right? Because they respond to changes in pH and that are also associated to changes in phosphorus. So yeah, there, the, the short answer is yes, there are similar uh, pieces of work that, that uses stable isotopes to identify uh, problems with phosphorus pollution in, in freshwater. Excellent. Um, I've got another question here from Amy. Um, can isotope testing differentiate between human and wastewater nitrogen and nitrogen from animals, both wild, such as geese, uh, and domesticated, such as cows, horses, and sheep? Uh, tricky. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes yes, sometimes no. So it all depends on how, how those uh, animals have been fed and stabilized, right? Like the wastewater nitrogen that comes from, from, from our houses, uh, it's very, very, very high in the nitrogen isotopic signature. And so it makes it very easy for us to, to see the signature. Now, uh, uh, when we have farm animals, the, the nitrogen signature that comes from that manure or, or, or the wastes that are generated in our farms, animal farms, it's also very high, right? Maybe not as high as the, the wastewater nitrogen that comes from, from housing. So when you have the two sources uh, in the same entering the same location, sometimes it's slightly tricky to differentiate which one is contributing more because they are both both of them high, right? So yeah, it depends. What what usually what we do to try to separate or partition which source is more important is that we collect samples of the wastewater nitrogen and analyze the stable isotope in that water, right? And try to get a, a very good number for the wastewater nitrogen coming from, from houses. And the, 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 the signature of the waste is gener generated by the, by the farms. And that way we have better numbers to compare with. In this study in, in Great Pond, it was very easy for me to see the wastewater because I was, I, there, there are not many farms in the area, uh, if any, and um, the the wastewater signature is going to be very different from the other sources that I was evaluating, fertilizer and atmospheric deposition. Those have a very, very, very low uh, signature. Um, I've got a, we'll probably do one or two more questions next. Um, the next one is from Melissa. How much of your results are a surprise and how much are they proof of concept? Good question too. Well, I I was surprised of the relatively good condition of the the pond, according to my results. Both the the sampling that we carried out just by looking at, at how much eelgrass and, and was present in, in my samples, as well as the isotopic signatures that that I that I found. Um, I mentioned that the nitrogen isotopic signatures that we found in the algae in a great pond are comparable to what I find in uh, places that are more uh, moderately impacted by wastewater. In those systems, I do not see eelgrass already. Mm. Only in the very, very low polluted areas, I find uh, eelgrass present. And so I was a little surprised that considering the amount of wastewater that the pond is receiving, and the presence of that nitrogen in the biological tissues that I analyzed, that the pond still presents a very, very uh, wide cover of field grass in the bottoms. So yeah, that, that was a little surprising. Then the proof of concept, I think that the, with regards to the opening of, of the inlet, it was very interesting to see that the isotopes immediately identified uh, the, the opening of the inlet and the, the erasing that terrestrial influence in the pond. 
And I was very glad that we collected samples of phytoplankton because phytoplankton cells grow so fast in a couple of days, they can double in biomass, right? That they respond like super fast to any of these changes. So uh, it was exciting for me to see it, right? Because sometimes you don't have the opportunity to, to actually capture uh, those changes with such level of detail and with the limited amount of samples that we actually collected. So yeah, well, cool concept, but very exciting too. Oh, that's great.